I got a call from President Johnson telling me that he had authorized the dollars uh, for, uh, for the, uh, the median strip surface line uh, out to Jefferson. And I was really excited about that. Uh, I, this is fantastic. And I remember him saying, yeah, you get this on the northwest side. I says, on the Kennedy. And Lyndon Johnson said, absolutely, that's, that's where it's going to go. So I called Dick Daly, and i excited. I says, geez, you know, it's fantastic. We're going to have uh, the surface transportation out to Jefferson Park on, on the Kennedy. And he said, really? I said, yeah. He said, the Kennedy, really? I said, yeah. Oh, so about 20 minutes later, I get a call from Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson says to me, uh, Dan, you know, I told you about that the money for that highway in, the, in Chicago. I made a mistake. It's the Dan Ryan. I said, the Dan Ryan? What do you know about the Dan Ryan? He said, well, uh, we're, uh, I made a mistake. It's the, the, the median strip extension uh, for the surface lines is going to be on the, on the Dan Ryan. I said, oh, really? Is that a fact? He says, yeah. So I called Dick Daly back. I said, you just talked to Lyndon Johnson. Oh, no, Dan. No, no, no. He was, it was just a mistake. Well, what Daly wanted, naturally, is he wanted that extension out to Ryan so that it went out to 35th Street as opposed to, to Kennedy. So uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is that... Uh, that uh, we got our money, uh, but it took about two more years. You know, I'm proud of the fact that when they talk about the 32nd Ward and Rostenkowski country, it's, it's really a pleasure because we do our job. We work in the venue. We aren't doing it just on election day or two weeks before. We're commuting with our commuting with our with our people in this community 365 days a week. Daly would call me and drop it on my doorstep, and then I would have to figure out what he's trying to do and then try and do it. And whenever Daly would say, "Well, I don't know about this," call Rostenkowski. That put me in the position of always saying, how did you become the leader? The leader is the fella that picks up the phone when the mayor is on the other end. That's the leader. Whenever there's something that we really need done, uh, whether it was UDAG grants in the past year and a half or helping us on the international terminal or any of the federal projects that we really needed, that's who we call. I wouldn't have his day if you gave it to me. I just wouldn't. I wouldn't have his job. I mean, it's somebody always wants something. What's the schedule for today? Whip meeting, new members caucus, 9.30, leadership, 9.45, speakers press conference, 10 o'clock house and session, 11.15, back in my office for an appointment with Robert Ball from the Social Security Administration, 11.30, uh, meeting with the gentleman from uh, outdoor advertising, 11.45, President of Litton Industries in California, 12 o'clock, Majority Leaders Luncheon, House in Session, 415, President Blue Cross, 430, Mr. Mary Thornton, 7 o'clock, dinner, New Democrats, 730, Congressman Scheuer's home for John Bradamus's uh, farewell party. Danny is a terribly honorable, forthright, hard-working, decent individual, and uh, somebody who has all those characteristics uh, is able to get things done in the nation's capital. My theory is, you know, and I, I started this very early in my political career, if you try to spread yourself out so that you're not really thin, but you're exposed to as many people that are moving, when lightning strikes, you might not get the whole bolt, but you'll get a bit of the shock, and that'll keep you moving. And all my life, throughout my entire political career, I, I like where the action is, and I move in that direction. And it's fun. He represents the people of Chicago very effectively uh, here. I think of him more as um, <clears throat> a... Um, as a man who can get things done, and I do of him as a philosopher, um, but as one who can get things done for Chicago or for his president, um, get a program through the Congress, he's 
very effective as one who puts the program together and decides where the country or the city should go. I, I don't think that's his role or his objective. Now, let me tell you something. The philosophy behind running the government of the United States, particularly the House of Representatives, is you put people on the committees, the three most important committees. Well, four now. You put people on rules, on ways and means, on appropriations and budget. Now, those four committees pretty much dictate what's going to flow on the floor of the House of Representatives. And you've got to be able to take the hard shots in those committees. You've got to be able to vote, to vote sometimes in the best interest of your country as opposed to the constituent in your area. Dan Rostenkowski is genuine. Uh, there's nothing phony about him. That's where you got to start. When I think of Dan, I think of the old uh, Roman uh, words that uh, began our modern English word sincere. They were two words, seen uh, serum w without wax. And it meant that uh, uh, if you had stamped upon an article <laughs> that it was exactly what it pretended to be or appeared to be and that there wasn't anything phony patched up about it. Uh, and that's what I think about Dan, without wax. He's sincere. He's just what he appears to be. And the members know that. You know, there's a great deal of, uh, of similarity between inner city politics and politicians and Southerners. They're a very, very deliberate moving group. They're a sure operation. They, they don't run off uh, you know, uh, with, uh, with wild ideas. And when Jim Wright won by one vote, I was the one that was doing all the counting. He can count that house. Uh, the members have great respect for him. Danny handles himself exceptionally well. He, uh, he's got a lot of straight corner sense. He's got a lot of uh, uh, backroom politics uh, knowledge. Uh, He's, uh, he's, he's out there with the, uh, the young progressives and uh, the conservatives from the various uh, south and southwest sections of the country have great respect for him. If I enjoy anything, I enjoy, uh, I think, for my colleagues uh, an appraisal that I'm frank, uh, I'm forthright, and uh, if, I, if I do get behind something, I, I'm not going to just uh, succumb to some uh, argument, uh, I'm going to try and win. I try to win. That's the name of the game. I've had the benefit of getting to know Danny even better since I left the White House. And it's always a pleasure to see him and especially to uh, play golf with him. He's a tough competitor. He hates to lose. And quite frankly, he hates to pay when he does lose. <laughs> If that's the way the game is played, you got to play it. And I'm not ashamed to, to go up to somebody in, in Mississippi or Texas if they've got something before my committee that they're interested in. I'm not ashamed at all to tell them that there's something in their committee that I'm interested in. And if you don't move, I don't move. Uh, you know, that's very political. But you get things done. The yeas are 321, and the nays are 36, and the conference report is agreed to. The motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. It will designate the First Amendment in disagreement. Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, when I first went to Washington, I was trying to convince Dick Daly that that's what we ought to do, send young people to Washington, young people to come to, come to Congress, so that ultimately, in the seniority progress system, uh, you wind up winning the war, and I'm, I'm talking about the Civil War, because the South has always had their lock on the committee chairmanships. I'm very fortunate to be put in this position, and yet, you know, you agonize as to what you think you should do, what you'd like to do, uh, what you think, you know, in the, in kind of the, uh, maybe even an autumn of a career, where, where would you like to have people recognize you, what would you like to have them recognize you as? You know, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee is, uh, is certainly a very, very high profile and always, quote unquote, powerful person. Everybody that describes the Ways and Means Committee talks about the powerful Ways and Means Committee. Uh, and you know, you, you've got to look at the circumstances, the President of the United States, the whole program of 
President-elect Reagan's uh, administration will come through uh, the Ways and Means Committee because that's the economic policymaker of the country. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's very um, flattering, really, to be put in this position. See you later. Thanks. The chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, in a sense, uh, has the responsibility of establishing some of the priorities. He can't move out and do whatever he wants. He has to put this judgment in context with where the House is and where the country is and what you can do politically and what you can't do politically. And that's the challenge. All my life, it's been with all my friends, what does Dan want to do? Now, I don't know that it's because of my position. It's just that I think I hope I'm creative. I hope that, uh, that I'm imaginative. Um, you know, I don't know that it's a natural ability, but that's kind of leadership. Danny is going to run a committee differently than I run it. He's a different personality. He's going to be a good chairman. He has what it takes to be a chairman. Oh, I just talked to Governor Thompson. Uh, there's a there's an amendment on the floor that uh, is in the uh, in the uh, safety surface safety bill, transit. The surface transit bill, and uh, we're going to try and it, it means a lot of money to Illinois. So he wants it to happen. Well, it, not not just Illinois, but all all the larger Midwest states. And so he wants it. We're going to try and push it for him. Today. Uh, and the governor gives me the impression that the only fellow that can do it is you, Dan. Uh, you know, one of those things. Now, so it's a total failure. It's all my fault. He just called, huh? Yeah, just got through talking. And he knows he has two days to get it done? Well, we got today to do it. We just got today. 23 what, Joe? 2318. He mentioned the fact that we'll come back in January and then... Uh, uh, count the electoral votes for the president and recess until the, t the 19th, I think, or the 18th, and then come back for the, come back for the, uh, for the swearing in of the president. Now, where is this? 23 what? 23, 18. This is Jim Wright's uh, luncheon. It's for, the new, it's for the new members. Hello. Oh, how are you? Uh, Good uh, nice uh, to see you. Welcome to Washington. Oh, welcome to Washington. Take care of yourself. Okay. Let me introduce myself. I'm Danny Rustenkowski. I uh, represent the 8th District on the northwest side of the city of Chicago. I've been here for 22 years. I just met Jim Wright and Mo Udall on the uh, tram going to and from the, the Capitol, where I'm sure after uh, the 5th of January, you'll be aggravated with those bells just like we are. But uh, we work like hell to get here. And then when they get here, uh, you assume a great deal of ob great, great many obligations, and one of them is, I guess, to keep a fairly decent voting record. Because uh, if your papers are any like ours in the, the city of Chicago, uh, they look more at uh, your average than on the substantive issues that you're voting on. It's really the scheduling, and that's where, in this leadership ladder, I'm the whipping boy, and I have to try to influence my leader, Jim Wright, and Tip O'Neill on balancing a schedule so that we can get to and from our districts. So that when you make an appointment with somebody, that you won't embarrass them by not showing up. And it's, it's true, the probably most important thing you do in the first two years of service in, your con in Congress is getting yourself reelected, keeping a high profile, visible at all times, trying to let your people know the service that you're giving them. And that pretty much comes down to the little point that I'd like to make in my presentation. And that's your commitment to, to us, to the Democratic Party, to the philosophy that we represent. Tip O'Neill said it very well this afternoon. He'd never ask you to vote on any bill that would embarrass you, that would certainly cause, uh, cause you uh, some concern with respect to getting reelected. But you know, the game is compromised, that's politics. And so what we try to do is we try to put a piece of legislation together that's going to be comfortable in our platform and certainly in the program that we present. 
But you know, there are sometimes concessions that one has to make in order to get a program through. So that's, that's what we do. We try to get the numbers so that we can comfortably tell the leadership, the speaker and the majority leader, what those numbers are so that we can take it to the floor. We would solicit your support. We'll call and ask you. We'll try to get position papers. We'll try to, to give you, if you need the excuse for supporting legislation, to give you the excuse why you can support it. And that's important. It's going to be more important in the next two years because what we're going to try to do, and we're going to have to work at this feverishly, is rebuild the party to work with our fewer numbers against a lot of money that's easily accessible to the Republicans. So when you're solicited for a position on a, on a bill, I hope after you've looked at it, you can come up with, with an honest opinion and, and try, if you can, to give us votes because it's the whole program that's going to be necessary that we're going to try to have to reflect on in the future. So unless there are any other questions, I'll turn it over to my boss, Jim Wright. You were great last time. That was one of the best I've seen. We're going to go through here, down that corridor, and then we're going to go like that. And what's at the end of it? CIA briefing. Oh. A CIA briefing on Poland, on, on the buildup of the troops and everything. We asked that uh, the CIA come in and give us an idea of what's happening so that we can, we can better answer, uh, answer the questions that are going to be asked of us. Of course, this will, there'll be a lot of classified things. So, so that, uh, well, what's the news about Poland? I mean, what have you been reading about? That's it. Let's see. You know as much right now as I do. It's, it's been in the papers. There's, a, there's a, uh, an army buildup. This is where it is, so I'll see you later. Okay. It's classified information. The situation in Poland is serious. The Poles are, uh, I guess, are tired. And uh, it's like the fellow that opened the window and said, I can't take it anymore. That's the attitude of people. When I come on this airplane, this pocket. The keys to the Chicago office come out and go in here. All the, all the Washington stuff goes back in there. Everything comes out. Change keys, change wallets. I just want to say that I've been granted a great privilege by you, by those of you that have consistently favored me at the polls by sending me to Washington. You know, I've come and asked your favor 12 times now as a member of Congress and six times as a legislator. That means that on 18 different occasions, you reaffirmed my commission. You uh, renewed my contract. And in the time that I've served you, I've certainly tried in the best way I know how to reflect credit on this community and the 8th Congressional District. I might say that 
It's really rewarding to visit the White House, to have breakfast with the President every Tuesday, and then come back to this community, a community that I've only been away from while in Washington on about 12 different weekends. Laverne just suggested that maybe I commute, and I've been doing that ever since. I've raised four daughters right in this community. Um, they're all in their 20s. Uh, Laverne's done a marvelous job of raising them. I was the absentee father. How long have I been saying to you, stay right here. This neighborhood is coming back. It's going to make the turn. And the only way that we can keep it is by you living here and working here. You know, I have four daughters, and every one of them played in this auditorium, as I did. I was born and raised where I live. The church that I attend uh, was, is the oldest uh, Polish Catholic church in the, in the city. I think it's about 120 years old now. Um, the, the, the park that is across the street from where I live, my grandfather lived on the site of the park and then moved across Noble Street uh, to Noble and Evergreen, and then they erected the park. Mainly, I wanted my kids to be Midwestern-oriented. I like the Midwest. I think that, I think that if there's a contrast, it's here in Illinois, Wisconsin, Missouri, Michigan. People want to tell you the way it is, and I, uh, I'd like my children to be raised under that umbrella. <clears throat> That's all. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Cut that speaker stuff out, will you? Ladies. Let's hear it for Nick Mouse. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I sincerely sincerely want you to know that no one, Chester Majewski, Viverito, and this little fella, Nick Mellis, works harder for the city of Chicago and the sanitary district. If anyone deserves re-election, these fellas do, and Nick, I'm glad that you came to Yeah, but congressmen are not high profile here, really. I mean, as opposed to uh, Wisconsin, a congressman is high profile. Here, and I guess it's the education over a period of years. Uh, here, the county recorder is very important. The county clerk is very important. Let me tell you something. Before I took over the leadership of the congressional delegation, congressmen were not even at the head table at the $100 dinner. I insisted that Daly put us up there at the head table. The first time Lyndon Johnson came to Chicago to speak as a candidate, we were not seated at the front table, the, the members of Congress. But you've got to understand this. As I said earlier, it was Social Security, Veterans Affairs, Immigration, and that was it. Now, it's revenue share. Every dollar that the City Hall gets has a complimentary dollar from the federal government. So, you know, naturally, you're going to start taking care of the bank account. Let me tell you something about Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson was a congressman, he was a senator, and he was vice president of the United States. And in every one of those activities, he knew what it meant to be, to be portrayed by, to your people as though you're important. Well, when I brought my wife to Washington for dinner at the White House with Lyndon Johnson, I mean, it, it, he was just a, just a regular fellow. He'd say, oh, Bird, his wife, Lady Bird, Bird, why don't you take the women upstairs and show them the private quarters? Now, you know, ordinarily presidents wouldn't do that, but show them the closet and show them the swimming pool. And, you know, let them know how we live here. And you know, for me to have had that exposure is just exciting. I mean, and he loved his job. Lyndon Johnson could not wait until he got out of bed in the morning to be president of the United States. And I think that he, when history is written, and it'll probably be a long time after you and I are, are history too, I think he'll be pointed to as one of the great, great outstanding presidents of, uh, of our time. Do you want to be the next Speaker of the House? Do you want to be the mayor of Chicago? Want, want to be, be Vice President? I think that 
you know, you just, I'm, I'm not ready to retire. Uh, I've, I said I've been very fortunate. I became a congressman at 28 years old. Men at 54 are still running for that job. I've moved up in the sphere of influence because of my seniority. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, in, I'm in my early 50s. Uh, lucky. Early, got involved early, had good parents, a great friend in Dick Daly. Uh, I think I had something to contribute to people recognized it. I mean, I, I appreciate that. But uh, I should think any citizen that says, I don't want to be mayor, I think there's something, you know, there's something wrong with that. I don't want to be a congressman. I mean, public service, uh, you know, is really uh, an obligation on the part of citizens. Uh, I don't want anybody to think that uh, that I wouldn't I wouldn't think about moving to another service. I, I think that uh, when you when you do that, you you lose the enthusiasm that you you speak of that I have, and, and I just think that you know it's good for it's good for everybody to to be uh, expecting promotion or to look forward to it. You know, is, is being the mayor of the city of Chicago a promotion for you? I don't know. I, I, I don't know that I judge it as such. Uh, you know, everybody has his area of responsibility. Certainly in Chicago, it's the most important office, uh, you know, that, that people recognize. Yeah, but for you. And I think, I think that Daly, Daly has made it that. Daly has made the mayor's office a very significant and important office. Uh, oh, I have a great deal of respect for that office. Okay, Tom, that concludes our association. Yeah. What now? <laughs> Bye -bye. Bye -bye.